My mom never thought I'd end up in a place like this. When you're Asian, there's no such thing as mental illness. It's a first world problem your immigrant parents just could never afford. Everyone gets depressed and anxious, they say. You'd be happier if you were thinner, got a boyfriend, prayed, drank more green tea. <laughs> but as a nurse clipped a hospital bracelet around my wrist, like a ticket for admittance, my mom looked like she'd begun to believe. She shook her head, her, her facade cracking little by little. My mother's brave mask fraying. I'll always remember that, the night her mask came off. In the hospital, we weren't allowed to use plastic forks and knives. We dug into plates of chicken fried steak with plastic spoons. Our toothpaste was kept in a closet for fear we'd try to swallow too much. The constant static of walkie-talkies and the doors that needed passwords before they whizzed open kept me up. So did the people I heard screaming and being tackled in the halls as they were dragged to shock therapy. I slept alone in a bed far from the door so I could look through the only window inside, covered in bars. Through the tiny spaces between the iron, I could see a parking lot. I stayed there, watching, listening, closely to the mixture of shuffling feet and car doors, always opening or slamming shut. People coming and going and coming and going while I sat confined to my room. The police officer's sarcasm was still ringing in my ears. So, are you going to kill yourself or not? You know, the police have better things to do than go to the house of every kid who wants to kill themselves and tell them not to do it. The other patient, patients shuffled past, peering in. I stared, I stared at the floor, noticing we all wore zip ties on our shoes. It'd be too easy to turn shoelaces into a noose. When I tried to go to bed early, a kind, elderly, African-American nurse named Rose came to my room. Do you want to join the other kids in the living room? She asked gently. We're watching Jeopardy. Everything we watched had to be rated PG or lower. When I tried to decline, she sat down on the edge of my bed in my room with too much air conditioning. Sympathy corroded the hopeful look in her eyes. No, baby, you can't do that, she said. Participate. Show the doctors you're trying and get yourself out of here. I'm 15, I tell Rose. And the depression is like an incessant weed, a black thing that drapes itself over my bones and the parts of me that I actually like. I've taken everything to kill it. Celexa, Prozac, lithium, sleeping pills. I cut myself with razors, scissors, broken glass. I tell her my dad died when I was eight and I miss him every day and how people at school make me wanna die how girls I used to know would spit on me, throw things in my hair, but I couldn't afford to be homeschooled. I tell her one of my friends was so shaken, she called 911, afraid, and now the cops have me on a 5150, an involuntary psychiatric hold. I'd only ever heard of that on the news when Britney Spears was placed on one for medical evaluation, and now I'm living in one. I tell Rose I always go to sleep hoping I'll never wake up. Oh, honey, she says, and I'm thankful. I wonder how long she's worked here. How many times has she stared into the eyes of kids like me? Has she seen too much? But her eyes tell me differently. It's a disease. We can help you, but you gotta try. Show them you're trying. Promise me. I read books and sat on an uncomfortable stool, planting flowers and painting in a room filled floor to ceiling with shelves of wood. Wooden jewelry boxes, frames, birdhouses. I joined the other patients. We sit together in circles for group therapy in the mornings. And then after dinner, we watch reruns of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. We even laughed. I lock eyes with Nick one morning during therapy as I was given a certificate for having the cleanest room. He was clapping amused at my awkwardness, and whistled at me later when we went outside, pointing towards a girl, sitting on her knees, praying to a drinking fountain. His, his hair fell in front of his wide brown eyes, his collarbone sticking up over the top of his shirt, so skinny. 
He got angry a lot, he told me, and had trouble eating. Often, a half-eaten carton of yogurt was the only proof he was trying. He never got phone calls, never, never had visitors, but he was always smiling. And he made me laugh. It was the last thing I ever thought I'd do in a hospital. In my room, I wondered late into the night about what it would have been like if I'd met Nick under normal circumstances. If we hadn't been kids wearing our pain so vividly on our chests, like name tags or shields. I tried to imagine us fitting together on the outside if we'd had time in the real world to get to know each other, to find out if we had more in common other than circumstance. Nick and I went on a date to the yard that sat in the back of the hospital room. <laughs> Rose grabbed a tabloid and sat on a bench a little far away, understanding Nick and I wanted to be alone, or as alone as we could afford. He presented a Connect Four box from beneath his arm. We'd start playing every afternoon, ignoring the other patients with Rose as a chaperone. I smiled at him, not caring that he could see the drying gashes on my wrists as he divided the red and black circles between us. Hey, he said, did you hear Jorge's getting out today? He hates his doctor. Told him he shit into a bag and hid, under his, and hid it under his mattress to get back at him. Oh my God, I said. Laughing so loud, Rose asked what was funny. As Nick deliberated his next move, I stared up at the barbed wire fence built high above our heads, separating us from the road. I watched as the sun set over a busy freeway with bumper to bumper traffic, everyone in a car on their way to somewhere else. And for a second, there was nowhere else I wanted to be. Our group came back from lunch too early once. We stood awkwardly to the side as the nurses did a head count. My eyes slowly widened as they dawned on the crowd on the other side of the doors. I watched silently as a new group arrived. The children were tiny. They were so young, barely kids. I'd bet none of them had even hit puberty yet. And as I wondered what had happened, as I tried to imagine what had gone so horribly wrong in their lives to bring them here, I found with frightening realization that this is what I must look like to my friends my, t my family, my teachers, too young with too much pain. After five days, my therapist was happy enough to let me out. I told the doctors what they wanted to hear, hoping I could leave. I missed everything about the life I'd left behind the hospital walls and chain link fences. Are you sure you're ready to, to go? Rose asked me, and I nodded, trying to look brave. I signed a form promising I wouldn't purchase a gun in the next five years, and packed my things. <laughs> Rose gave me a flyer with things to remember to do next time I felt upset. Snap a rubber band around my wrist, squeeze a stress ball, hold an ice cube. I'll call you, I promise, Nick, and I'll write you. We stood awkwardly next to each other, unable to hug, co-ed rules. <laughs> the air hit my face as we walked, and as I stepped outside into my freedom again, I caught sight of a sign that I hadn't seen in the dark when I arrived. UCSD Children and Adolescent Rehabilitation Center. I was 15 years old and I'd gone to rehab. A few years ago, I looked Nick up online and tried to find him. I only found his sister telling someone they'd moved somewhere. I couldn't find a picture of him, but I was only happy he was still alive. Things didn't suddenly get easier after knowing what it's like to be such a threat to yourself that you had to, had to press pause. Sometimes I let the memories surface and wonder how many people in those rooms who shared circles with me, who came and went and came back again and again, how many of them are still alive? My voice still does this thing where it wavers like the end of an ellipses, like when I told Rose about being sad, but I'm still here. And I try to remind myself that recovery is every day. It never stops. Life just keeps daring you to live through it. I no longer hope I'll overcome my depression, but that's not something that should make you sad. I only hope one day I'll come to peace with it because it'll always be there, hand in hand with me, like we're lifelong neighbors. It's like water. Sometimes it's okay, gently lapping at my feet, sprinkling on my hair, and days are good. And other times, it's black and deep, 
and threatens to drown me, and I can only cling on until I surface again. But I remain, and I guess, if actions speak louder than words, then perhaps that speaks to volumes. I'm still here. Give it up for Jennifer Manalili. We're gonna take a very brief 10 minute break, so use the restroom and claim your seats and we'll be back in 10. <laughs> 